Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear and other random stuff. I was very excited to get my hands on this Sony TV750 from approximately 1972. This TV came from Dundas, Canada. This is a black and white television that can be used plugged into the mains or with batteries. It's a portable that you can carry around and be stylish. Pick it up and take it to the beach or wherever else you want to go. That's how Sony advertised it, as a portable that only weighed 15 pounds, had a generous 7-inch screen with rechargeable batteries that would last long enough for your favorite program. Let's take a tour before we get into what it does and does not do. On top, there is the antenna in need of some help, and it's also loose. Here is the UHF, or Ultra High Frequency Channel Tuner. It tunes channels 14 through 83. Most don't exist anymore. Over here is the VHF tuner. And that's for channels 2 to 13. Vertical hold, horizontal hold, brightness and contrast. Down below, I like that blue bright on it. That's the on-off volume. On the side, that holds for a headphone jack. Imagine fitting that into an iPhone. On the rear, these controls you don't normally use. Vertical linearity and vertical height. These are terminals if you want to use another antenna and a switch for selecting the internal or external antenna. And this is where you plug in the AC adapter or if you wanted to use it in the car, there's even an adapter for that. There is a huge compartment for nine D cells or a rechargeable battery. You can charge the batteries while they're inside the television. On the front is a seven inch black and white cathode ray tube. To give you an idea of how small this is, a Mac Plus or Mac Classic, any one of those original Macintoshes had nine inch screens. So this is smaller than that. Finally, it says that it's solid state. That means that it uses all transistors, diodes, and integrated circuits, and no tubes. It's not quite true because it does use one tube, the picture tube. Flat screen TVs wouldn't come out for another 20 years. Let's hook it up to 12 to 13 volts and see what it does. I've turned the television on its side and it looks like a decently bright picture. That's at full brightness. But let me turn on the light. That's closer to the actual brightness. You can tell that there's something going on, but you couldn't actually watch it. But just to make sure, what I'll do is send in a video signal and see if any picture appears. Again, that doesn't look like a bad picture until you turn on the light and <laughs> you can't see anything. Yes, there is something there. So what's causing this? I know it's not the voltage coming in. Generally speaking, when the voltage coming in is low, the, the picture ends up being too small. You don't have the vertical height or the width. You get a small picture. You don't get a dim picture. Not unless the voltage is very, very low, which it isn't. If I had to take a random guess, the high voltage is not making it to the picture tube. Anyway, let's open it up, see how it looks inside. I took out two screws on the bottom, four in the back, and all six knobs, and here we have it. This is the sweep board here, sweep deflection board here, with the high voltage transformer, or often called the flyback transformer right there. This is a power supply board there, and the signal processing board must be on the other side, the sound and video. But before I do anything, it needs to be brushed out. It's, it's very dusty. Look at how tiny the neck of the picture tube is. It would be quite fragile. Hopefully the picture tube is not the problem. Now I'm seeing all kinds of brown gunk in there. And I don't know whether maybe somebody poured something accidentally or on purpose into the, inside the set, 
or whether maybe a battery leaked at some point in the distant past. No, it, it could not have come in from the top. There's stuff on the uh, plastic battery housing and underneath. And that's all going to have to get cleaned up, whatever it is. Four screws hold in the chassis and two hold in the picture tube. And it reveals this. I'm guessing it's battery goo, but it's looking pretty nasty. I'm going to take this and, uh, and wash it and see what happens. With gloves, of course. I also had to cut the two wires to the battery compartment. Most of that brown stuff seems to be water soluble, so I think it must be battery leakage. But I'm going to use my brother's toothbrush and remove the rest. It may change the flavor of the toothbrush, but I don't think you'll notice. I'll try some vinegar, which hopefully will remove the remaining stuff. This is not battery corrosion. This looks like it's from the picture tube, so it's uh, carbon. Now that can probably come off with alcohol, but that's, uh, that's not nasty or corrosive. There was uh, battery acid all over the inside of the TV, on the wires, on some of the terminals. Fortunately, not too much on the printed circuit boards. And of course, this is the bottom of the TV that was closest to the battery compartment. There's almost no evidence of corrosion here. There seems to be a little bit over here, which may be our problem, but I need to clean this off and see what it looks like underneath. I've cleaned off this corner and yes, the corrosion did damage the copper, but that's just a ground plane. It makes no difference there. Quite an accumulation of rust on the high voltage terminal. I already begun cleaning it off. It should look like black rubber, maybe with some dust and that's it. Maybe it's corroded underneath and that's what's holding up our high voltage. But if that was the case, I would expect there to be arcing. To troubleshoot a TV, you need to decide what you think the problem is. That determines where you're going to look. I believe this is a brightness issue located in the circuits leading up to and including the picture tube. For the CRT to operate with proper brightness, it needs to receive the correct voltages and a video signal. Let's look at the connections leading to the CRT. Pins 3 and 7 are heater cathode. Usually, the heater and cathode are separate, but not in this tube. If the circuit can be believed, the heater cathode receives about 0.2 volts, which is incredibly low. Normally, it's around 6.3 volts. In this TV, the signal is impressed upon the heater cathode and not the first grid. I'll talk more about the video circuits in a moment. The heater cathode is supplied by a transformer, which runs off the horizontal driver and horizontal output transistors. This way, the heater cathode is isolated from ground. Pin 2 is the first grid. It receives about 6 volts from the vertical blanking transistor circuit. It looks like the purpose of this is to blank the CRT during vertical sync intervals. If this stopped working, you'd expect to get a picture, but retrace lines would be visible. Pins 1 and 5 are supposed to get 175 and 6 volts respectively. These are focus voltages from the flyback transformer. If these were missing or out of range, you'd still get a picture, but it would be hopelessly out of focus. The other voltage the CRT needs is the high voltage anode, which is approximately 9.6 kilovolts. That voltage comes from the flyback transformer through a voltage multiplier made up of high voltage diodes and capacitors. If this high voltage is low, the screen will be dimmed. I'm already suspecting the rectifiers, which in this generation of sets would almost certainly be made out of selenium that do not age well. Looking at the signal path, the signal from the video amplifier is amplified by the video output and is capacitively coupled to the heater cathode of the CRT. The brightness control sets the DC bias on the heater cathode between ground and V-boost. V-boost should be about 93.5 volts, which comes from the flyback transformer. 
If there's something wrong with VBoost or the control or any of the intervening resistors, that would reduce the brightness. The contrast control sits on the emitter of the video output, which receives its VCC from VBoost. It sets the amplitude of the video signal merged with the horizontal sync signal. If the horizontal sync signal was missing, the picture would be rolling uncontrollably. If there was an issue with the contrast control, C509, or the output transistor itself, there would be contrast issues. I am convinced this is mostly a brightness issue, not a contrast issue. If this was a contrast issue, I would have to troubleshoot all the way back to the video detector. I do wonder about the brightness control, which is this one over here, whether it's any good. Maybe it's been damaged. I'm going to check the resistance of potentiometer's resistance element and then power up and get some voltages. 70 kilo ohms uh, across the element. It should be 250 K, but it's hard to know whether there are parallel resistances in the circuit which are making it look lower than it actually is. I will have to disconnect one end of the element probably the left one in this case, to get a better measurement. And if it's anywhere near 250K, there's nothing wrong with the control. But if it's, let's say, around 70K, no, that's no good. Measured 220K, so the brightness control is not the problem. The boost voltage should be around 93 volts. It's 90 volts. And the grid 2 voltage should be 175. It's about 170. Uh, that leaves this. And to do this, that's the high voltage, should be 9.5 kilovolts. I'm betting it's not, but I need a special probe to measure that. This is a high voltage probe. Notice how long it is. It keeps you away from, well, on, for this, up to 42 kilovolts. Uh, one end has to be grounded. This I have to insert underneath the anode cap over there and See what it says. It should be 9.5. I bet you it's not. Eight kilovolts. That's low, but I suspect something else is going on. There may be something funny in the video circuitry. So that's where I'm going to start poking around next. The brightness control should vary the voltage from about zero to about two thirds of V boost. And if it doesn't do that, then there's something funny with the brightness control, which keeps coming back to me. Anyway, let's, let's give it a go. No problems found with the brightness control. If I turn it up, it almost goes negative. But the contrast really doesn't do very much, and it should. Oh wait, no it's not. So maybe the contrast control is actually where my problem is. Finally, something beginning to make sense. This is the contrast control, it should be 1000 ohms. Here it is, at one end it's um, 1400 ohms, then I reduce it, it goes down to about 200 ohms, and then up to 1400 ohms. That's not right, or maybe even 2K. So this control is bad for sure. Yeah, that's bad. I tried deoxit control cleaner, and it really made no difference. The control is bad. I need to find a 1K potentiometer with a split shaft an inch, inch and a quarter long. Not too surprisingly, the answer is no. I don't have a 1K linear potentiometer with a small body and a one inch plastic D shaft. I've wired up uh, jumpers as if the contrast was in its maximum position. And I have a picture, it's not Wonderful, but when I turn up the brightness, it almost uh, it, it almost goes negative, which can be <laughs> uh, a symptom of a bad CRT, which would suck, but these things happen. 
Either way, I need to get a new potentiometer, and a genuine Sony part isn't going to happen. A replacement potentiometer, probably going to take some time. The other thing is to replace the selenium rectifiers with new silicon rectifiers, which might boost the high voltage, which would give me a bit more brightness. Don't forget to discharge the high voltage anode by slipping a screwdriver underneath and grounding it. Not as bad as I expected. Two screws hold in the flyback transformer from behind, and I'm going to see if I can take off what normally would be called a high voltage cage. I don't know what it's called here. Inside the metal can is a plastic box, and inside the plastic box there's the flyback transformer. That green disc is one of the high voltage capacitors, and those long white things are selenium rectifiers. You may be familiar with selenium rectifiers as being finned things, but those are low voltage selenium rectifiers. This is actually a stack of a whole pile of them in a cylinder, and they deteriorate just like any other selenium rectifiers. I'm not going to bother trying to power up the set and measure the voltage across them. I'm going to dig them out. We finally reached the inner sanctum. There they are. I hope all that effort was worth it. Those, I think, are 18,000 volt diodes. They're a microwave oven diode, so they're much higher current than those. It did make some difference. I'm now getting 10 kilovolts off the high voltage anode. With the new rectifiers in, I think I get maybe a little bit more brightness, but the same sort of saturation effect I think it's a weak picture tube, to be very honest with you. I guess the next plan is to get a potentiometer for the contrast control and to put it back together and not watch too much TV on it. That's the bracket that holds on the antenna. It's a little bit loose. I should be able to tighten it. The antenna is intact, except for the seventh section. So I use a self-tapping screw to pull out whichever sections I can, fully extend it. There's the new tip, some red vinyl tape, the heat shrink. Now it's easy to grab, and it's not going to poke anybody in the eye. I guess that's where we're going to have to leave it right now, waiting for the potentiometer to come in. And when it comes in, I may do a short video. In the meantime, if you have any ideas how to squeeze a little bit more brightness out of this, then please leave it in the comments. I'd be very interested in reading your suggestions. I hope you enjoyed this video from Mr. Brown's Basement. If you did, please give a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel for more interesting and unusual content.